I hope to really inspire you today. I have a lot of material. Um, um, what I've done is I've taken a talk that's normally an hour long, cut it down, but I'm still going to go pretty, pa pretty fast through it. And um, the real thing I want to do is I want to show you some demos at the end. We've been working in the studio on some really cool stuff, a couple of apps that have been going on over t uh, a year in development, which in the, in the app world is a really long time. So um, this is going to be the first public viewing of some of our new stuff. And I think you're really going to enjoy that. So with that, let's roll and just get right into it. Um, did you know that projected sales for the iPad this quarter are going to be more than 13 million units? Did you know that Amazon's Kindle Fire, the new device to compete with the iPad, is going to sell 5 million units? Did you know that when the Kindle sells 5 million units this quarter, that will be more than the iPad sold its first quarter? Right? So we finally have some real competition coming out for Apple. Um, if you add up all of the iOS devices and Android devices that are activated every single day worldwide, it's a million new customers per day. Mobile is real. It's a huge market. <laughs> Did you know that Dr. Seuss published his first book 75 years ago in January? And finally, did you know that that first book was rejected by 43 publishing companies before a friend of his from college who happened to work at a publishing company took pity on him and was willing to publish that book? There's something to be said for perseverance. So my company, Ocean House Media, develops and produces the Dr. Seuss line of iOS, Android, um, WebOS apps. We've been doing this only for two years. But I thought it would be interesting to open up with some stats. So um, in the first two years, we've released over two dozen individual apps, ebook adaptations. Eleven of these apps have reached the number one spot in the books category on the uh, App Store. Four have reached into the top 100 overall, competing where pretty much the land that only games play, where 75 or 80 out of the top 100 are always games. We've tapped into this market that uh, a couple of other publishers have realized, which is that even though books are going digital, a children's book on a normal black and white Kindle sucks, <laughs> right? It just doesn't work, or, right, okay? Or, or a children's book in an EPUB standardized format sucks. Why? Because kids want interactivity, and in order to have interactivity, you have to have an app, right? Um, a really deep, rich app. And that's exactly the world that we found ourselves in. This is a snapshot of the top of the books category, I don't know, a couple of months ago. Um, this is not the children's books category. This is the books category. And if you look at it, 20 of the top 25 are children's books. I think we happened to have four or five on the top of that chart that day. We've had a lot of success. We've been very fortunate. You can see from the 2010 um, top overall annual charts, we actually had five out of the top ten best-selling books um, for iPad last year. What we do is we do more than just books. We look at the brands as a full, all-encompassing property, and we also do games, and we do photo apps, and what you're going to see at the end of my presentation today is our very first um, venture into the music space, which is uh, something we've been really looking forward to. <coughs> Part of our strategy is to do games that can get on the charts so we can use the games to cross-promote the books and vice versa. As of today, we have almost 200 shipping apps. We've developed all of this um, in-house with our own group in under three years. There's something really interesting that happens when you build a lot of apps. You learn a lot. You ever heard the term, fail fast, fail sooner? We failed a lot, but we've also learned a lot. As of today, right now, we have a whiteboard with all the apps that we have currently in development. It's somewhere between 30 and 40 apps that are all in development all at one time. A lot of engineers, a lot of shared code. Last February, we announced that we had sold our one millionth app. It wasn't one million downloads of a 
free app. It was our one millionth paid app. And we don't sell most of our apps for 99 cents. So it's when we realized we had a real business. And we found a lot of things that work for us. And my goal today is to share some of those things with you. One thing I will say is that the app business is development on Lightspeed. I'm going to go into a little bit of my background, so I'll save it right now. I have a couple slides, but um, I have been doing this type of thing for a long time, and I will tell you that the app business is the fastest, most nimble business um, that I've ever seen. It's very technology heavy. Um, it's extremely competitive. Three years ago, just over three years ago, there was no app store. Now there's 500,000 apps on the app store. That is a lot of competition. So anyhow, um, at Ohm, one of the things that we do in order to, com uh, to keep up, you know, like I said, is we make sure we, uh, we put out a lot of apps, we put out a lot of high quality apps, and we average shipping one to two new apps per week. <coughs> so the real question is, if it's gonna be this hard, and it's going to be, um, I have to you know, change my mindset and I have to compete with you know, tens of thousands of global developers, is it worth it? And the answer is an absolute resounding yes. In 2010, there was $6.8 billion spent on apps. In 2015, it's gonna be $25 billion. It's a lot of money. It's a big opportunity. So in order to understand who we are, um, I think it's important to tell you a little bit about my background. I graduated um, from school 22 years ago, um, University of California in San Diego. And uh, I'll ask you to take note of that logo. We have a very um, interesting library on campus. I'm, I'm all the way across the country, so you may not have seen a picture of it. But um, I'm going to come back to that. Um, I was actually a visual arts major, and I just enjoyed um, working with computers, even though I was learning film and TV. And uh, I used to t tinker on one of these. You know, it was a 40 megahertz machine with eight megabytes of RAM that cost $8,000. And um, you know, the first kind of takeaway is, for especially for your students or anyone just getting started, um, don't underestimate the value of tinkering and playing and poking around and inventing because that's where a lot of the great new ideas come from, right? If you know where you're going, um, it's a lot less likely you're going to stumble into something really, really unique and original. And the other thing is that by the time you're learning something in school, anything that a, that a, that a, a university can teach you, you're probably already three years behind the curve. You have to learn how to self-educate, and you have to learn how to be out there, because you know, it's just now that the universities are teaching you know, game-level design that was important in real game-life professional stuff three, four years ago. Anyhow, this was the first significant software product I worked on. It was a title called Verbum Interactive. It was the world's first interactive multimedia magazine. Get this, you could click on underlined words and it would jump you to other random places in the magazine. It was really cool. Well, especially it was for 1989. Anyhow, I got a lot of experience doing that type of stuff. <coughs> that was my first entrepreneurial venture. I left that company and really decided to follow my passion. And I started a small little video game company called Presto Studios. Some of you may have been familiar, may be familiar with it. Um, it was an independent video game development company where a bunch of high school buddies and college buddies said, what would it be like if we could build the game that we always wanted to play? And we could take advantage of CD-ROM, that great new shiny disc that allowed you to put tons of data on there. And what we did is we, we, uh, we locked ourselves in a house literally for two years eating pizza and ramen and whatever, and we borrowed $70,000 from our parents so we could live over those two years, and we came out with a game called The Journeyman Project. And some of you may have heard about it, um, but uh, <coughs> you know, basically it was nine guys just, just, just absolutely figuring out you know, how you could build something that we wanted to play. And it was the world's first photorealistic adventure game. We knew that we had to sell about 10,000 copies to justify the effort that we put into it. None of the publishers we talked to would commit to selling 10,000 copies, 
So we said, screw you, we'll do it ourselves. We self-published. Over the next couple years, we sold 100,000 copies. So um, I have a lot of experience in high-end game design. These are some of the games that we built over the years. Apresto, you may be familiar with them. Miss 3 Exile was the one that was the most well-known. It actually was number one on the PC charts for a while, which was really great. <coughs> you know, something happens when you start to find success. People come to you and they ask you to help out or they ask you to talk or they want your advice. Here's another really interesting tip for you. If someone asks for advice or to help or to sit on an advisory board or something like that, say yes. They're asking for your help, but you don't know what you're going to get back out of that relationship. Most often the time, y you really don't know. If you have an opportunity to stay involved with your school, do it. UCSD, now you see the full building, asked me to sit, of all things, on their library advisory board. Library? I never went to the library when I was in university. <laughs> What, would, what on earth would I do with the library advisory board? Anyhow, I decided to say yes, and um, it's just one of those takeaway tips. So everything was great, right? Life is fantastic. We're making millions of dollars in revenue per year. Well, you know, we were on a train full steam ahead, and the reality was <coughs> it wasn't as good as it looked. Um, the video game model is very, very broken. You see independent game companies these days going out of business left and right. Game development costs have gone through the roof. We went from developing our first game for $70,000 to five years later, we couldn't build a game for less than $3 million. Nowadays, you can't build a decent game for less than 15, 20 million. Anyhow, I learned a lot um, and I decided to shut the company down. We didn't have debt. I just realized that it wasn't the lifestyle that I wanted to have. Um, the publishers were just just grinding us down and we were getting too small of a piece of the pie. And um, I just knew I, I, I couldn't be in that situation anymore. I took two years off, didn't work. Took a job with a small little company called Autodesk. Some of you may have heard of it. Um, I was a business, um, <coughs> I was a, uh, a director of business development with them for four and a half years, which was kind of cool. I got to travel around the world and schmooze and you know, represent at uh, places like Nintendo and Sony and learned a lot. But an interesting thing happened. This was the first real job I ever had. And, um, and I got to experience something that a lot of other people got to experience around the time of uh, late 2008 and early 2009. What? <laughs> what? You're firing me? Just because the stock dropped 80%? Are you kidding me? Anyhow, um, what was interesting about it is um, for the first time in my life, I found like, well, the, uh, these corporate jobs are supposed to be the most secure, right? It's like, no, maybe they're not quite so secure after all. Um, but there was a little voice in the back of my head, and it was basically saying, there's gold in them our hills. And it was bright, and it was shiny, and it was full of awesome. And there it was. And there it was. See, the iPhone is more of a game changer than CD-ROM ever was. And I saw that with CD-ROM we were able to build a company, maybe not as successful as we wanted, but we built a company. And I thought, what if I could do it again? Now, last time I was 23. I didn't have a care in the world. I could borrow some money from my parents and eat ramen. This time I was 41, I had a wife, I had a mortgage, and I had a six-week-old baby. So, all of a sudden, you had to enter the committee of rules, right? I had to sit down with my wife and basically say, I want to start a business. Come on, let's go. <laughs> Here we go. Number three. <clears throat> she said, that's fine. Just don't spend any of the family savings to do it. Right. Okay, well, I'll see if I can figure that out. And then the second part was, oh, and by the way, it seems like your severance is about three months and you had a sabbatical, so that's another week and a month and a half. So you have four and a half months to get the same level of um, salary you were making at Autodesk. Otherwise, we'll rethink this. Anyhow, said, all right, here we go. Boom. <coughs> Literally, two days later, we were up and running within, um, uh, we had a logo and the website and everything up and running within two weeks. And um, all, all I knew I wanted to do is I was so PO'd at the publishing companies from the video game world, I said, this time I want to be the publisher. I want to be a digital publisher. And then my wife said, of what? I said, I don't know. We don't have any content. I just want to publish. Because that just looked better to me, right? The publishing model looked better to me. So anyhow, um, all I needed, I, you know, I was, I was kind of getting 
to the place in my life where I knew what I wanted to do, and I wanted to build apps that uplifted and educated and inspired. I had no idea we were going to be doing children's books. None. <laughs> Zero. Basically, I just followed the breadcrumbs. This was our first app. Um, it was just a simple, single, little app. You know what? It was a Tibetan bowl simulator. I got a bunch of buddies together. No one got paid. Nights and weekends. From the time that we started the business to the time that we shipped this app, 51 days, right? Everything. The company, the app, everything. On day 52, we were earning revenue. And I said, hey, this is interesting. How many apps would it really take to build a business? And then I said, you know, if we have to build them all from scratch, it's going to be really tough. Let's see if we can license some content. And I started reaching out to companies that were important to me. I told you I wanted to do things that were uplifting and inspirational. I went to a local company in town, Hay House. They happen to be one of the largest spiritual metaphysical publishers in the world. They have a handful of, you know, small authors, some of whom you may have heard of, Don Miguel Ruiz, Wayne Dyer, Doreen Virtue. For those of you that know these names, you'll realize that they are, they are absolutely top of the charts. Um, New York Times bestseller, every single one of them. And we found success there. I thought that we'd have to have six or ten or eight apps in our first year in order to be successful. We ended up having 70 because we were able to license other people's content. So my wife and I were walking through Barnes & Noble. Now it's like a shopping list. Who can we license? What can we go get? Right? This is the early days of the land rush. And my wife said, how about if we go get Dr. Seuss? And I said, you're nuts. We're still working out of the house. It's still just my wife and I, a bunch of contractors. How on earth are we going to get Dr. Seuss? And lo and behold, we did. And I'm going to come back to that. We signed a deal with Dr. Seuss in October of 2009 with one catch. They gave us the rights to one title, How the Grinch Stole Christmas. It had to ship for that Christmas. Let me repeat, we, sold, we signed the deal in October of 2009. <coughs> Remember I said this business is nimble? In five weeks, we had three apps shipping. We had the book, we had a camera, and we had a game. <coughs> the game went to number eight on the App Store. The book was picked by CNET as one of the top ten apps on iPhone and the camera was picked by CNN in their holiday roundup as one of the best holiday apps of the year. We've since rolled from that into a full strategy of apps because we went back to Dr. Seuss and it was we said, it's great that you gave us Grinch, but how about if, you know, maybe we could do one or two other ones, Cat in the Hat, ABC, something? And they said, why don't you take the whole catalog? Take all 44. You did such a great job. I said, all right. <laughs> That'd be fantastic. <coughs> That'd be fantastic. So now we have a plan to do 60 to 80 Dr. Seuss apps within the next three to four years. We're still working out of the house. And then Steve Jobs got on stage and said, I've got this really cool iPad coming. And we went back to Dr. Seuss and said, what do you think? And they said, yeah. We amended the contract, iPad. Now, I want to get a little bit into design because um, you know, it's an interesting question when you start to ask yourself, you have the rights, but what are you going to do? We spent a lot of time thinking about the books. I, I, you know, I say we signed the deal in October and we had it out five weeks later, but I'm going to get into it. To be fair, we've been thinking about what we'd be do since the summer, okay? And you have to ask yourself in design, in mobile, just like all good design, what do you add, what do you not add? And our goal was really to be as true as possible <coughs> to the books. And basically what we did is we sat around and said, literally, what would Ted do? Ted Geisel, Dr. Seuss. If he were alive, what would he do in an app? So we put ourselves back into his head when he was writing Cat in the Hat. And it was, you know, yes, it's, it's silly, it's whimsical, it's rhyming, it does all these kinds of things. But at the core, what is Dr. Seuss all about? teaching kids how to read, teaching kids how to read. And all of a sudden, we had one filter. Is this feature going to teach a child how to read? Yes, it goes in. Is this feature going to teach a child how to read? No, it's out. 
And that's how we got to our very, very simple design. It's so important that you have filters to try to figure out what exactly are you trying to do, right? So individual words are read, are highlighted as the VO is read. The book is read to you by a professional actor and the words highlight. You tap on a picture. Now, you could tap on a picture and have the cat start tap dancing. Is that gonna teach a child how to read? No, you touch on the picture and the voice and the narrator says, cat in the hat. And it's reinforced by the text coming up on the front of the screen, the cat in the hat, right? Have, if any of you have ever taught a three-year-old how to read or a four-year-old how to read, you know, when the child is touching, you're like, tree, sky, oh, that's the birdie, that's yellow, that's blue. That's all we did, right? So this was our focus. Um, we did a lot of music. We did a lot of custom voiceover. We thought there was a lot that we could do with the audio because that was just blue sky for us. Um, but I, you know, don't get me wrong. There's a place for just pure entertainment, kids books and Disney and Nickelodeon and a lot of folks do that. It's not what we do. We know exactly what we do and that's, that's just what we focus on. We teach kids how to read. For all of you actually doing this, the biggest thing I would say is you have to learn how to simplify. Most people don't know when to stop in design and they're just adding features and features and wouldn't be cool if and do I need this and all the rest of it. If you set up your filters in advance, then the questions answer themselves. And that's really the most important part. And if you ever want to get your apps on Android, you really, really better watch your features. Because Android is a mf -er when it comes to trying to get stuff across, okay? Um, now, ratings matter. Different people have different opinions on this, but from my perspective, ratings matter. And we have a slogan in the office. And basically that slogan is, five stars or no stars. If we collectively as a group do not believe that the majority of the people in the world are gonna vote an app five stars, we don't let it go out the door, right? What else does it need? What's it missing? What polish is not there? What, 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 right? There's a reason why companies like Blizzard have had the success that they've had. That's kind of the mentality that they've got. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. And thankfully, we average about a four and a half out of five stars across, mo across most of our apps worldwide. Everything is about the details. Now, apps are living, breathing entities. You don't throw them over a wall and forget about them. You don't publish them once and then, you know, it's like a book, you know, maybe we'll do a second edition and fix it, but all the first editions never get fixed. Apps are live. You have to update them over time. In the first <coughs> 18 months, of the first Dr. Seuss apps being available, they were updated six times. And that was new features, new functionality being added. And we have a lot of new stuff still coming. So this kind of um, started to ha have us ask the question, you know, what is the publisher now, right? Because if, if we did a normal business deal where a publisher was asking us to build something and then they took it and they published it, that deal doesn't end. They'd actually be saying, well, now we want this, and now we want this, and now we want this, and everything gets a lot more complicated. And we said, you know what? This all has to be the same entity. So we won't ship an app unless we can publish it, which means we've turned down a lot of work for hire in the last three years. We only build apps that we can own soup to nuts, the whole, I mean, the whole end to end. We have to have the whole thing. Some people say we're nuts. Um, some people say we are nuts. But you know what? It's working. This is, a, this is a screenshot of how many apps we had in the top uh, 100 or 200 just a couple days ago. Um, in the books category right now, we've got about 15% of the total market. They're uh, Ocean House Media products. Um, so anyhow, let me roll back the clock a little bit. In, uh, in December of 2009, we introduced Grinch. In February, we introduced Cat in the Hat and ABC. And as I said, um, then Steve Jobs surprised us and announced the iPad, right? We saw it as an opportunity. They wouldn't send us an iPad, right? We couldn't see one. We, saw, we had the same amount of information as every other developer in the entire world, even though we had Dr. Seuss and we had stuff at the top of the charts, and we basically said, all right, we are gonna gamble 
that Apple's simulator is really good and that our engineers are really good. And we submitted four apps for Apple approval on the iPad without having any hardware. And they all got approved. And I saw them running on my iPad the day that UPS delivered it, which was the same shipping day. Right? None of this closed room, any of this stuff. We literally built on the simulator and it worked. And that's one of the things I got to tell you, I love Apple. I love Apple. It's such a fantastic company. God bless Steve Jobs, wherever he is right now. Wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today if it wasn't because of him. Now, the world is not just Apple. The world is getting a lot more complex. The reality is you have to be on Android. We do support Android. We're on the Google market. We're on the Amazon market, which is going to explode with the Kindle Fire. We're on the uh, Barnes & Noble uh, market, which is effectively an Android market. We just announced HP support on WebOS, and we're looking at other platforms. iOS is pretty easy to get into, but basically what this is saying is this is becoming a very, very real software market. And you have to have very, very good engineers that know what they're doing. And we've worked oftentimes with really, really um, experienced game developers from, the back, from, my, from my background. So if you're trying to build a business, I'll just ask you this question. Um, how much do you lose by limiting your platform options? When you go out to start your design, be thinking cross-platform. Android today is not going to pick up a lot. But a year from now, when there's a lot of uh, Amazon Kindle fires out there, it's going to be a significant piece of your business and you're going need to be needing to be doing simultaneous releases. Now, I think we should talk a little bit about pricing on the App Store because this is the part that I have the hardest conversations with the publishers and the authors. <coughs> if you want to be in this space and you want to understand what's happening in the App Store, this is a book you must read. Chris Anderson, editor of Wired Magazine. Basically what it's saying is if, if any product is digital, it will not hold relative to physical prices. And in any industry that they try to maintain price parity between physical and digital, whatever's happening in that physical side, it's going to explode, it's going to blow up, it's going to get pirated, it's going to be whatever. Like I don't care if it's music or movies or newspapers or whatever. It's just not going to fly. So we knew that going into it and we didn't even attempt to have price parity from day one. So on the bottom, you've got Green Eggs and Ham on Amazon, and on the top, you have Green Eggs and Ham as an interactive book. Now, what's uh, our interactive book? Now, what's crazy is the top one reads to you, has educational value, has music, sound effects. If you own five iOS devices, you can put it on all five iOS devices, right? Your dog's not going to eat it. It might eat your iPhone, but you know, maybe it's under Apple warranty. I don't know. You can get another iPhone. You still own the app, right, for life. And so therefore, we're less than half the price, right? But the trade-off is we're available in 100 countries, and we have no cost of goods, and we're selling all the time, 724, and there's no inventory, and there's no wholesaling, and there's no shipping from China, and there's no none of that. And you just have to look at it and say the market is different, and therefore the prices have to be lower. Now, this is another book that if you really want to understand what's going on, it's a, it's a critical one to read, The Long Tail. Same author, just happens to be Chris Anderson. Um, and he, he t I don't have the time to get into it. Write it down, Google it. If you want to understand this market, it's a great read. We do more than just Dr. Seuss. We focus on, um, right now, what we've announced is 15 different licensing deals that we've done. I talked about Hay House, I talked about Dr. Seuss, but these are all companies that we've either contacted after, afterwards or they've contacted us. And, uh, you know, basically the iPhone is revolutionizing a lot of businesses and children's publishing is one of them. Um, this just kind of, for those of you that are designers out there, you might see, you might find this is interesting. This is how we uh, mark all the products. We actually have our standard blue wave outline, and then we kind of do a sub inset for the little sub brand or imprint on it. And then um, all of our uh, books, we've uh, done a trademark on this term, uh, own book for Ocean House Media Digital Books. And anytime you launch one of our children's apps, that's what you'll see. I wanted to give you some really good practical takeaway tips. So here you go. My top 10 practical takeaway tips for how to get you going. Number one, you got to do your homework on how to run a business. You got to remember that it's business first, right? You got to have the right structure in place. And this book by Guy Kawasaki, The Art of the Start, is fantastic. 
If you follow this chapter by chapter, which I did when I started Ocean House Media, it'll get you a long way through making the right choices. One thing out of this, that I'll just give you an example. How do you get to ramen profitable? How do you get enough money coming in the door that you can live and eat ramen? Because once you reach that point, you're, al like you're almost over the hump. Right from there, you can work full time, you're eating ramen, and now maybe next week I can get a tuna sandwich. And then the week after that, maybe I can get a turkey dinner. And eventually you get to a point where you're paying your mortgage and your car payment and all the rest of that stuff. But he talks about things in a real reasonable way to help you get going. Number two, you got to find your own personal passion and you got to be doing something that you're passionate about because there's going to be shitty days. There's, and I'm sorry, if I apologize. I just looked over and saw the kids sitting over there. I'm sorry. There's going to be days that are not so good. <laughs> it happens. And if you're not doing the, something that's got you just fired up about, it gets really, really rough. Okay, so you know, for us, like I said, I started with that slogan. We build apps that uplift, educate, and inspire because that's important to me. That's what I like to do. Now, this may be a strong statement, but this is what I believe. Code is a core competency. If you want to be an app developer, writing code is a core competency. Therefore, it has to be in-house. Right? There's a lot of things you can hire out for, bookkeeping and whatever, but if you're not writing your own code, managing your own code, how are you going to be a software company? Really? Um, you got to keep your expenses low. It takes a long time to build a steady revenue stream on the App Store, longer than you think. When you first put out your plans, you got to roll those numbers out two, three times longer. But once it's there, you can do it. Um, I haven't got time to go into it. You know, I have strong feelings about um, angel money and VC money. I think that they can be damaging to companies. I think they can give an entrepreneur an early feeling of success or, yeah, I've made it, when actually the proof is when you have a product that's making enough money that you're, you know, you're cash flow positive, that's when you've made it. So um, anyhow, that's just kind of my personal belief on that. Um, you don't need to hire up a lot of employees. What you need is really great contractors, and you got to figure out a way to motivate people, right? Uh, you know, I, I want you to write this whole chunk of code or do all these graphics or whatever, and I'm going to do something to, to compensate you for your time. And it doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to pay you by the hour or do whatever. You just got to be creative on how to convince people to do things. Right? That's what being a leader is. That's what being a CEO is. You got to figure out how to way to convince people to do the things that are really going to help both of you. Right? And you do have to be helping both of you. I think it's critical that you do your own public relations. When I say you, it doesn't have to be you. It could be someone in your group. But uh, you know, I'm a strong believer in your message is what's out there, and you have to own it. Like you know, your Twitter feed, your Facebook page, your whatever. Like that's got to be you. It's your voice. This is again my opinion, but this is one of the first places I invested. Some of the first employees I did hire were a full-time social media gal and a full-time PR person. It was that PR person that got me on NPR, right? 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 We owned it. Um, so this comes from, from Guy's book. If you can identify an old business in transition and you can insert yourself, that's where the real opportunity is. Think to yourself, do I know an industry? Do I know a person? Like if you want to get into mobile, what, can you think of an industry that might have a hard time technologically getting into mobile? Can you think of a way to help get that company or that industry across to mobile? For me, book publishing was a no-brainer. You're a book publisher. How good are your engineers? Right? So we knew that there was an opportunity to help out and step in. Um, aside from being a pretty awesome looking apple pie that's kind of tasty, um, you know, you don't have to do this alone. You don't have to be greedy. When you learn how to share a pie, you can really get a lot of stuff done. If I was trying to code everything and do everything all by myself so I could own the pie, I wouldn't be able to have, you know, 200 apps that we're selling now. We have 200 pies, and I get a much smaller piece of every single one. But you know what? At the end of the day, the math works out better on that. So be really careful if you're so controlling that you think you have to own the whole pie. Things work really well in nice small groups. 
Love this shot. Um, the video game industry used to give out an award every year. I don't know if they still do. It was called the First Penguin Award. It was the first company to jump into truly uncharted uh, uh, waters. I think Blizzard won one for, uh, for Warcraft when they came out with the first real-time strategy game. And there's been a lot of other things where people have done really innovative things. You know, um, you, you create opportunities oftentimes when you're the first one in the pool. You're gonna take a lot of arrows, right? It's not the leading edge, it's the bleeding edge, right? It's not gonna be the most fun. But doing something first, there's a tremendous value in there. So, um, you know, you just, you go create the opportunities that don't exist because you're not just following people. Um, number 10 is probably the most important from my perspective. You never stop learning. It's a lifelong process. It doesn't end when you get out of school. You know, I, I, I just, I'm voracious when it comes to business books and entrepreneurial books and trying to figure out how I can continue to better educate myself at all times. Once someone can teach you something, oftentimes you're behind the curve, right? When I say teach, I mean in a formal setting. So you got to figure that out. Um, all right, so, you know, as in an ode to Steve Jobs, and I fully recognize that from those of you that recognize the Stanford commencement address, uh, the dots can only be connected in reverse. People oftentimes ask, how did the Dr. Seuss deal actually come about, right? And most people say, wow, you're so lucky. How did you get the rights to Dr. Seuss? And the answer is, it was a lot of um, either lucky or smart or working hard times at, ex at exactly the right points in time. You know, it didn't happen overnight. The iPad and iPhone rights to the whole library only came about because we executed when we had a five week window to deliver three awesome apps for the holidays. I guarantee you, I did not sleep much during those five weeks, right? But we saw the opportunity and we went for it. Now, how did we get that opportunity in the first place? Well, we executed when we had the opportunity to have an in-person pitch, right? When Dr. Seuss finally said, all right, come on in, I didn't just go in with PowerPoint. I didn't just go in waving my arms. I literally handed them an iPhone and said, here's a book. Check it out, right? It took about 10 seconds to sell them because they saw the full operational working product because we were willing to invest that much. Now, how did I get that phone call in the first place? Because there was a number of companies that were trying to bid on the Dr. Seuss rights, even at that time. Well, it all comes back to this building. Remember, I was saying that I was asked to sit on the advisory board for the libraries, and I never really understood why? Well, you know, for me, now I understand why. It took 10 years for it to reveal itself. The name of this library, when I was in school, was called the Central Library. It's since been changed to the Geisel Library. Audrey Geisel, Dr. Seuss's widow, is the largest benefactor of the UCSD library. And when my wife was standing in Barnes & Noble and she said, do you think we could get the rights to Dr. Seuss? I said, hmm, maybe I could give Brian a call, the head librarian, and maybe he'd be willing to do an introduction. And when I talked to the people at Dr. Seuss, Susan Brandt, the president of Dr. Seuss said, you know, there's lots of people that are asking for the rights, but Brian says you're a pretty sharp guy, so I'm willing to give you some time to come in and show me what you want to do. And it was literally as simple as that. So, you know, I love this uh, quote, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And, um, you know, how ready are you going to be when those opportunities present themselves to you? And what are you going to do to ensure that those doors are constantly opening for you? Now, I promised you I would show you some demos. So there's my contact info. It's going to flash away pretty fast. But after I'm done with the demos, I'll put it back up. Um, how much time have I got? Wow, three, four minutes. Okay, I'm going to do this really fast. And maybe the next presenter won't hate me if I go a little over. So um, here we go. I told you that normally takes me an hour. So um, I was trying to talk as fast as I could. <laughs> all right, so um, anyhow, this is, all, this is all stuff that we've done. You can see all of that. We, we, I told you we were doing really, really simple books for the longest time. I don't have time to show you Cat in the Hat today, but um, if you want to see it afterwards, I'll show you. This is a new book 
the, a deal that we did with Random House and Dr. Seuss, it's going to launch on Wednesday. You literally are the first. The Cat in the Hat's Learning Library. And so There's no place like space. You can see books are evolving, right? It's not black and white. It's not going to be static. But um, check this out. I mean, I just, I just love this book. Fully animated. I'm the cat in the hat, and we're off to have fun. We'll visit the planets, the stars, and the sun. So it still works for emergent readers, right? Cat in the hat. So you can tap on any word if you want to learn. You can drag the cat in the hat around. Cat in the hat. You can touch on pictures and get Sally. their names. I'm going to jump <laughs> forward a couple pages. Oh, I totally jump forgot in. to show you this. Here we go. You can uh, tap on bold words. Moon. The only natural object that moves around Earth. The surface of the moon is dry and covered with craters, rocks, and dust. And you know what's awesome about it? We've been showing this to kids in first to fourth grade, and they love it. They love it. And it's it's just so much fun to be able to show this. We will swim. But look at this. You want to understand the solar system? There's the solar the system. The planets in our solar you know, system. How's that for a book, right? Jupiter, Saturn, Earth. Right? It's cool. And you can pull the planets and they bounce back. Or you can pull the whole solar system and then the whole, they bounce back. So, um, look, if you want to see more of this, I'll show it afterwards. But, close uh, you can come up and play with it. Because it this other one, it, as cool as that is, okay, now this is officially the first public viewing of something that I don't know when it's exactly going to ship. It's going to be like three ish weeks from now. Don't hold me to it. But um, literally, no one has seen this. And it's been in the works for a year. Yeah, yeah, real quick, and maybe I'll take questions afterwards. Is that all right? Okay, so um, the question was this. If Dr. Seuss were to build an instrument, what would it be like? What would it be like? Right? Okay, here you go. Now, here's the thing. Okay, maybe you don't want to play that. Maybe you want to play something more like a flute or a clarinet. Maybe you want to go up an octave. Okay, down an octave. What if I want to be playing it through a train whistle? What if I want to be playing it underwater? Okay. Fun stuff, right? It's about to get better. What if it was actually like rock band? And I'm learning how to play music. going to pull me off stage, but uh, what do you think? Yeah? I'm pretty much out of time, but if people want to come play with it, I'm, I'm happy to let you play with it. It's a custom build on my device, and uh, we're just so stoked. This has literally been a year in the works. So, uh, anyhow, thanks so much for giving me the opportunity, and thanks to the organizers for having me out.